I told my wife to show me her phone after I got an email accusing her of cheating. I never imagined myself in a position of doubting Emily. My life has always felt steady, balanced, almost comfortable. I'm 47, with a fulfilling job, three beautiful kids, and a marriage that I thought was, if not perfect, then certainly built on a foundation of trust and mutual respect. Emily and I have been through everything together, from long work hours to late nights up with the kids. She's not only my wife but my partner in every sense. We've shared a life filled with more laughter than arguments. A life we built together with a quiet determination. So, when I got an email last week that questioned her loyalty to me, I felt my world tilt on its axis. It arrived in my work inbox out of the blue. And even after reading it three or four times, it still felt surreal. It was from a woman claiming to be the wife of Jake. One of Emily's friends from her years living in the UK. Emily had lived there between 2010 and 2015 while finishing her PhD and building a network of close friends. Jake included. I knew she'd developed strong bonds with several people there. She'd make a trip back to the UK every couple of years to reconnect. And I never had any reason to feel uncomfortable with that. The email, however, changed everything. This woman, Jake's wife, was certain that something was going on between Emily and her husband. The accusation was so blunt so out of nowhere, that I didn't know whether to laugh it off or panic. According to her, Jake had picked up Emily from the airport when she visited for the wedding of one of her friends this past August. Which I knew, but she went on to describe other incidents. Jake supposedly spent significant time at Emily's hotel. They frequently went out for dinners together alone. And even more unsettling, she included photos as supposed proof. There was a picture of a pair of earrings she said she found in Jake's pocket while doing laundry. Earrings that looked identical to a pair Emily had, delicate, with small silver hoops. And then she showed a picture of a lipstick stain on Jake's shirt. The color one I recognized. Something Emily often wears. As I read through the email, I felt a mix of emotions, disbelief, anger, confusion. I wanted to shrug it off as a cruel joke. Some bizarre attempt to stir up drama in my marriage. After all, it wasn't hard to fake an email or make up a story. But even as I told myself that, certain details stuck with me, refusing to be dismissed. Emily had spoken to Jake several times in the weeks leading up to her trip. I remember noticing at the time but brushing it off as her getting back in touch with an old friend. Now, with this new information, my mind kept replaying those moments, making them feel somehow suspicious. One thing that really nagged at me was Emily's feelings toward Jake's wife. She had always been polite but distant when talking about her. Almost like there was something unsaid between them. Now I couldn't help but wonder. Was it just a personality clash? Or was there something more? The email had planted a seed of doubt. And it began to grow. Twisting my memories into strange shapes. Emily had been excited about the trip. And we'd both agreed it was best for me to stay home with the kids. I hadn't thought twice about it, three weeks was a long time. And I couldn't leave work for that long. Besides, taking three young kids on an international trip for a wedding? It made more sense for her to go alone. She'd sent pictures and called every couple of days, giving updates on the ceremony, her friends, and the beautiful venues. Looking back, there wasn't a single moment that stood out as odd. But now, I kept turning over every little detail, every memory, questioning what I'd missed. To make matters worse, the earrings she had taken with her on the trip never returned. She'd mentioned losing them while traveling, and I'd thought nothing of it. It was a minor thing, easily forgotten. But now, with Jake's wife insisting she'd found a pair of earrings in her husband's pocket, the detail gnawed at me. Could it have been a coincidence? Or was it the missing link I hadn't realized was there? I felt torn, pulled between two instincts. One part of me wanted to sit down with Emily, to show her the email and to demand answers. But another part of me was terrified. What if she confirmed my worst fears? Or, perhaps worse, what if she had no idea what I was talking about, and my accusations broke something irreparable between us? We'd never had trust issues before. Never snooped through each other's phones or questioned each other's friendships. If I looked now and found nothing, I knew it would hurt Emily deeply. And yet, the doubt lingered, growing stronger by the day. I began to feel like a stranger in my own life, burdened by questions I couldn't bring myself to ask. My imagination started to run away with me. Every time she laughed with the kids or told me about her day, 
I felt a strange disconnect, as if I were watching from a distance. I'd never wanted to be that person, the husband who doubted his wife or suspected her motives. But the images from that email, the earrings, the lipstick, it all kept replaying in my mind, a relentless loop of suspicion. And through it all, I wondered if I'd ever feel like myself again. I wrestled with the thought of checking her phone, something I'd never done before. It felt invasive, even disrespectful, but at the same time, I couldn't ignore the pull. My mind kept running through scenarios, imagining what I might find or how she'd react if she caught me looking. If I acted too quickly, she could delete everything, leaving me without answers. But if I stayed silent, I'd keep suffering in this silent limbo, a prisoner to my own suspicions. Days passed with the email hanging over me, a dark cloud casting shadows over my every thought. I still hadn't confronted her, still hadn't looked at her phone. And the longer I waited, the more I felt that something inside me was breaking. I was desperate for guidance, anything to point me in the right direction. The best idea I had was to ask Emily to show me her phone immediately after I confronted her, hoping that would prevent her from hiding anything if there was something to hide. But even that idea felt tainted. Could I really live with myself if I treated her like that? Even if I found nothing? The irony wasn't lost on me that the email, whether true or not, was already doing damage. It had created a distance between us that I didn't know how to close. I kept wondering how something like this could happen. How a single email could unravel the trust we'd spent years building. But as much as I tried, I couldn't unsee the images. Couldn't forget the accusations. And the earrings. Those little details that had once meant nothing were now the foundation of my suspicions. And with each day, my desperation grew. Pushing me closer to a decision I wasn't sure I was ready to make. I wanted to believe it was just some cruel joke. I went through the usual motions at work and with the kids. Trying to pretend the email didn't exist. But in every quiet moment, it came creeping back. Like a shadow I couldn't escape. That night, as I watched Emily read to our youngest. Laughing softly with her. I told myself this was just a bizarre misunderstanding. An email sent to the wrong person. Or some jealous outburst with no basis in reality. The next day at work. Though. I couldn't concentrate. I'd go through emails and phone calls, meetings, and tasks with the information from that email lingering in the back of my mind. It began to feel like a splinter, irritating and impossible to ignore. Every time my phone buzzed or a new email popped up on my screen, my stomach clenched. I found myself searching my memory for anything odd from Emily's trip, even questioning the little details of her daily routines since she'd come back. Nothing stood out. But the suspicion gnawed at me anyway. I hadn't seen any unusual behavior. But with every detail that Jake's wife had mentioned, my mind couldn't rest. Every interaction we had was different now. Almost like an out-of-body experience. She didn't seem to notice. Chatting about the kids and her friends as usual. But it felt strange and wrong to have all these thoughts swirling around while she went on. Unaware. I tried to dismiss it. But it was like a seesaw of emotions. One moment I'd feel sure she couldn't be guilty, and the next, my mind would replay the details from the email, and I'd wonder if I was being naive. The earrings, the lipstick stain, those weren't figments of my imagination. They were real, and I couldn't brush them off no matter how hard I tried. My patience wore thin as the days passed. I found myself glancing at Emily's phone when she left it on the table or when she was in another room. I'd never been one to pry. And part of me hated even thinking about crossing that line. But the more I thought about the possibility of simply checking her messages, the more tempting it became. Would she even notice if I looked? Or was I just setting myself up to find things that didn't exist? I kept rationalizing, telling myself that if she'd really done something wrong, there would be some sign on her phone. But every time I was close to picking it up, my hands froze. I knew that looking without her knowledge would break our trust just as much as her hiding something from me would. Even my memories of Emily's trip to the UK began to feel tainted. She'd been excited for months leading up to it, planning her outfits and talking about the friends she couldn't wait to see. I remembered her telling me about Jake's offer to pick her up from the airport. At the time, it hadn't felt strange, she'd explained how close they'd become during her years there. Now, though, I couldn't help but wonder if it had been more than friendship. If she'd had feelings for him that I'd been blind to. And, of course, I couldn't ignore how she'd never warmed up to Jake's wife. I used to think it was just a personality clash or maybe some cultural difference. 
But now I found myself wondering if there was a deeper reason. I questioned whether Emily had intentionally kept her distance to avoid any conflict. It was these small details that played on my mind, coloring every memory of that trip, and even making her laughter and ease with me feel staged. I became hyper aware of her behavior, watching for anything out of the ordinary, though I knew I was probably reading too much into everything. Every time she'd reach for her phone, every message she received or sent, and every time she was out for errands a little longer than I expected, I'd feel a sinking feeling in my stomach, wondering if she was secretly messaging Jake. But then again, there was nothing concrete, just the familiar routines of our everyday life. Still, my perspective had changed, and it felt like a dark cloud had descended over our home. One evening, as we sat at the dinner table, Emily seemed more distant than usual, quieter than she'd been in a while. I watched her closely, unable to shake the feeling that she was hiding something. I knew I had to say something before this suspicion drove me to insanity. But the words stuck in my throat. I didn't want to accuse her, to risk shattering the life we'd built with our children sitting right there. Instead, I pushed the thought aside, telling myself it was nothing, but the pressure of holding it in was building, weighing on me, and I knew I'd have to confront her sooner or later. A couple of days later, I was sorting laundry when I saw Emily's favorite lipstick, the exact shade described in the email, on the bathroom counter. I picked it up, staring at the familiar color. Remembering the image of the lipstick stain on Jake's shirt, it could have been pure coincidence. But in that moment, it felt like another piece of the puzzle falling into place. I'd been telling myself all week that it was all just a trick of my imagination. But holding that lipstick in my hand, all my doubts came rushing back. My hesitation turned to anger, not at her necessarily, but at the feeling of helplessness that had begun to consume me. I felt trapped in this mental loop. Unable to ignore the email yet powerless to confront her without proof. I couldn't shake the feeling that if I didn't do something soon, I'd lose my grip on reality. Part of me wondered if she could sense my mood change, but if she did, she didn't mention it. The more time passed, the more convinced I became that I couldn't let this slide. I was reaching a breaking point, and something had to give. I was tempted to finally just ask her directly, to demand an explanation, but every time I pictured the conversation, I saw her shocked, hurt expression and felt the weight of the accusation hanging between us. I was terrified that I'd ruin everything if I was wrong, but equally terrified of what I'd discover if I was right. When I couldn't take it anymore, I called an old friend, a co-worker who had gone through a rough divorce after his own experience with infidelity. I needed to talk to someone who'd been there, who could offer me some guidance on how to handle this without tearing my life apart. He listened patiently as I explained the situation, letting me vent every doubt and suspicion, every uncomfortable detail from the email. When I finally finished, he was silent for a moment. You're right to feel unsettled. He said finally, that email was way too detailed to ignore. But, if you trust her, don't accuse her outright. Instead, tell her about the email. Let her see how it's affecting you. If she's innocent, she'll understand. And if she's guilty, he trailed off the implication hanging in the air. I thanked him, but even after our call ended, I felt uneasy. His advice was logical, but I couldn't shake the feeling that bringing it up might make things worse. I thought back to everything I knew about Emily, every moment we'd shared, every quiet reassurance I'd taken for granted over the years. I didn't want to believe she could betray me like this, but if she had, if there was even the slightest chance, I needed to know. I couldn't keep living in this limbo pretending nothing was wrong. Later that night, I lay in bed next to her, feeling the weight of my indecision like a stone pressing down on my chest. My mind raced with possibilities, each more painful than the last. The next morning, I resolved to confront her. It was tearing me apart. And if I didn't do something, I'd lose not just my trust in her but my sense of myself. The only way forward was to confront the truth, whatever it might be. The more I tried to ignore the email, the more it gnawed at me, like a constant whisper in the back of my mind. For the sake of our kids, I kept the worst of my emotions to myself, but I knew I couldn't hide them completely. Emily noticed something was off, she glanced at me during dinner. Brows knit with worry, or ask if everything was okay when I seemed distracted. Each time, I brushed it off, forcing a smile and saying I was just tired from work. But the truth was, I felt trapped between two worlds. One where Emily was innocent, 
and I was just overreacting to a misunderstanding. Another where everything I believed about my marriage was unraveling before me. Days turned into a strange, endless cycle. Every morning, I'd resolve to move past the email, to trust Emily and let things go. By night, I'd lie awake, unable to shake the images and accusations the email had planted in my mind. I kept going back to the photos. I'd memorized the details, the earrings that looked just like hers, the smudge of lipstick on Jake's shirt, the pattern on the table at the restaurant where they'd supposedly dined alone. The evidence, whether real or fabricated, was meticulously crafted to get under my skin, and it was working, no matter how hard I tried. I couldn't separate my memories of her trip from the suspicions the email had stirred up. On a Saturday afternoon, as I sat on the couch watching our kids play in the living room, Emily approached me with a questioning look. "Are you okay?" she asked, her voice gentle but concerned. "You've seemed distant lately, like you're somewhere else." I looked at her, and for a brief moment, I considered telling her everything: the email, the accusations, all the doubts that had been clawing at me since I'd read it. But as I opened my mouth, our son tugged on her hand, asking her to play a game with him. And the moment passed. I watched her laugh and play with the kids, feeling a strange mix of love and resentment simmering inside me. I didn't want to believe the worst of her, but the weight of my suspicions was growing too heavy to bear. As the days dragged on, I started picking up on little things. Her phone buzzing late at night, the way she'd sometimes step out to take a call, her mentioning a friend I hadn't heard of before. They were all things that would have gone unnoticed before, but now they seemed like pieces of a puzzle, hints of a life she might be hiding from me. I wasn't sure if I was inventing these signs to fit my suspicions or if I was finally noticing the cracks in our marriage that had been there all along. The urge to check her phone became almost unbearable. I'd never crossed that line before, but the idea gnawed at me, tempting me to break my own rules just to find a shred of peace. Late at night, as she slept beside me. I'd stare at the glow of her phone on the nightstand, wondering if the answers I needed were just a few taps away. Yet every time I stopped myself, I knew that looking without her knowledge would betray her trust just as much as if I accused her outright. Then one morning, she told me she'd lost a pair of her favorite earrings. She mentioned it casually, almost as an afterthought, but the detail hit me like a punch to the gut. The silver hoops? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Yeah. The ones I took to the UK, she replied, rifling through her jewelry box. I think I must have dropped them somewhere during the trip. I was hoping they'd turn up, but I guess they're gone for good. I nodded, swallowing hard. My mind flashed back to the photo in the email, the same earrings, or at least a pair that looked identical, sitting innocuously in Jake's pocket. I felt my heart race, and I forced myself to look away before she could see the panic in my eyes. Whether it was paranoia or a genuine clue, I couldn't be sure. But it felt like one more confirmation that my fears weren't unfounded. The unease continued to grow. I felt a constant tension around her, a discomfort that made every conversation feel stilted and forced. She'd ask me about my day, tell me about something funny one of the kids did, or make plans for the weekend, and I'd respond mechanically, my mind racing with thoughts I couldn't share. Every interaction felt like a performance. Each moment spent pretending everything was fine while the weight of suspicion loomed between us. One night, as I lay awake beside her, I thought back to the time we'd spent building our lives together. I remembered the vacations we'd taken, the laughter we'd shared, the quiet moments of simply existing side by side. All those memories felt tainted now, touched by the darkness the email had stirred up. I wondered how much of our marriage had been real and how much had been an illusion. If she was capable of hiding something this big, what else had she kept from me? The tipping point came one evening when she left her phone on the counter while making dinner. I stood there, staring at it, heart pounding in my chest. I told myself I wouldn't look, but the temptation was overpowering. I glanced at her, watching as she chopped vegetables and hummed softly to herself, completely unaware of the storm raging inside me. I took a step toward the phone, reaching out. Only to stop myself at the last second, my hands shook as I realized what I was about to do. The lengths I was willing to go to find answers. The phone buzzed with a new message, and I felt a surge of adrenaline. But I forced myself to turn away. I couldn't do it. Not like this. That night, I lay awake, my mind racing with thoughts of how I'd confront her. 
The weight of my suspicions was crushing me, making it impossible to think clearly. I knew I couldn't keep pretending nothing was wrong, not when every day was filled with tension and doubt. But the idea of facing her, of asking her to explain herself, filled me with dread. What if she denied it? Or worse, what if she confessed? In the morning, I decided I couldn't wait any longer. I'd spent too many nights lying awake, tormented by questions that had no answers. The email had shattered the life I thought I knew, and there was no way to go back to the way things had been. I had to confront her, to demand the truth, no matter what it might cost me. I spent the day mentally preparing myself, rehearsing what I'd say and how I'd react. By the time I got home that evening, my resolve was set. I walked into the kitchen, where Emily was helping our daughter with her homework. And felt a pang of sadness at the sight. I knew that whatever happened next, our lives would never be the same. Taking a deep breath, I waited until our daughter left the room, then turned to Emily. My voice was steady but low, betraying none of the turmoil raging inside me. I need to talk to you, I said, watching as her expression shifted from curiosity to concern. Is everything okay? She asked, setting down her pen. I hesitated, feeling the weight of my words before I spoke. I got an email last week. I began, carefully watching her reaction. It was from Jake's wife. Her eyes widened, a flicker of confusion crossing her face. What, what did it say? I took a deep breath, bracing myself. She said she thinks you and Jake had an affair. Emily's face drained of color, her hand coming up to cover her mouth as she processed my words. What? That's insane. Why would she think that? I felt a strange mix of relief and anger at her reaction. The immediate denial doing little to quell my doubts. She listed a lot of things. Emily, the time you spent alone with him, dinners together, even a pair of earrings she says she found in his pocket. She shook her head, a look of horror on her face. You, you don't believe her, do you? I hesitated, the question hanging heavily between us. I don't know what to believe. I admitted, my voice barely a whisper. I don't want to think you could do something like this, but the details. The photos, they're all there. Emily's eyes filled with tears as she reached out, placing a hand on my arm. I swear to you, it's not true. None of it. My heart pounded as I struggled to process her words. The desperation in her voice, the pain in her eyes, it all seemed genuine. But the doubt was still there, lurking just beneath the surface. I took a deep breath, forcing myself to ask the question I'd been dreading. Will you show me your phone? Asking Emily for her phone hung in the air between us, a request I'd never imagined making. Her face shifted from confusion to hurt, and I felt my own heart twist as I saw the sadness fill her eyes. But she didn't protest, instead, she reached over to the counter, picked up her phone, and handed it to me without hesitation. I could barely meet her gaze, ashamed of what I was about to do but unable to stop myself. I took the phone from her, my fingers trembling as I held it. The weight of my actions pressed down on me, the cold realization that I was breaking an unspoken trust that had been the foundation of our relationship. She sat there, silent and still, watching me with a mixture of hurt and disbelief, and I could feel the fracture widening between us. I hesitated, looking at the screen, the temptation to search through every corner of her phone battling with my guilt. But before I could unlock it, a surge of doubt washed over me, and I handed it back to her. I, I can't do this, I whispered, barely able to look at her, I'm sorry, Emily exhaled, relief flashing across her face as she took her phone, her hand shaking slightly, I don't know what's going on, but I don't want us to go down this road, she said softly, I love you, and whatever it takes, I'll do to prove that I'd never hurt you like this, her words hung in the air, and as much as I wanted to believe her, the remnants of the email still haunted me, the next few days passed in a strange, tense silence. Emily tried to reassure me, making an effort to be open about her phone and her conversations. But my mind refused to let go of the doubts. I'd taken a step back, but the nagging feeling still simmered beneath the surface, affecting every moment we shared. Eventually, I realized I couldn't keep this turmoil bottled up any longer. I needed someone outside of our relationship, someone who could help me see things more clearly. After a day of indecision, I finally decided to confide in Chris, a close friend and co-worker. We'd known each other for years, and he'd always been level-headed and insightful, someone I could trust with the details that felt too overwhelming to face alone. We met at a quiet cafe after work, 
and I wasted no time diving into the situation. Chris listened, nodding thoughtfully, letting me lay out every detail, the email, the photos, the lost earrings, and the struggle I'd felt between trusting Emily and believing the evidence presented to me. When I finished, he leaned back, his expression serious. That's a hell of a thing to carry around on your own. He said, no wonder you're torn. I can't blame you for wanting to look at her phone or find some proof either way. But, I think you're right to hesitate. Checking her phone without her knowing could make things worse. And once you cross that line, it's hard to go back. I nodded, feeling a mix of relief and frustration. I thought about asking her for her phone, and she handed it to me without question. But it just felt, wrong, like I'd be betraying her trust. Even if I didn't find anything. Chris sipped his coffee, considering my words. Look. I know it's easier said than done, but if there's no real proof outside of that email, you have to ask yourself if you're willing to jeopardize your relationship over it. Do you think she's capable of doing something like this? The question hit me hard, and I took a moment to think. No, I admitted, she's never given me a reason to doubt her. She's been a great partner, and we've always been open with each other. It's just, I can't get those photos out of my head. The details, the lipstick stain, the earrings, it all feels so real. Chris nodded. I get it. But consider this. Whoever sent that email probably knew exactly what they were doing. It's easy to mess with someone's head if they know what buttons to push. If Emily handed over her phone without protest. That says something too. She's not hiding it. A wave of guilt washed over me. And I looked down at my hands. I know. And that's why I feel so torn. I don't want to accuse her without cause. But I also don't want to ignore something that could be real. What would you do in my position? Chris thought about it for a moment before answering. If it were me, I'd have a real conversation with her. Lay it all out there. Tell her everything the email said and explain how it's affecting you. If she's innocent, she'll understand why you feel the way you do. And she'll want to work through it with you. If she's hiding something, well, you'll know soon enough. I let out a sigh. Feeling the weight of his words settle over me. It was sound advice, but it didn't make the prospect any less daunting. Confronting Emily directly meant risking our relationship, opening a door that I couldn't close once I'd stepped through. But as much as I dreaded it, I knew he was right. If I didn't confront this head on, the doubt would consume me. Thanks, Chris, I said, grateful for his honesty. I think you're right. I can't keep avoiding this. No matter how scared I am of what I might find, he reached across the table, giving my shoulder a reassuring squeeze. You've got this, man, no matter what happens. Remember that you're a good person and a good husband. And if Emily's the person you believe her to be, she'll understand and help you work through this. I nodded, feeling a mixture of fear and resolve. It was time to address the doubts that had been gnawing at me. To face the truth, whatever it might be, as I headed home, I braced myself for the conversation that was about to unfold, hoping I could find the strength to handle whatever came next. That evening, after the kids were asleep, I took a deep breath and sat down with Emily. She looked at me, sensing the seriousness in my expression, and I saw a flash of concern in her eyes. I took her hand, steadying myself, and began to speak. Emily, I need to talk to you about the email I received. I could see the confusion return to her face as I continued. It wasn't just any email. It was from Jake's wife. She claimed, she claimed you and Jake were having an affair. Her face drained of color, and her eyes widened in shock. What? Are you serious? Why would she say something like that? I swallowed, forcing myself to continue. She sent pictures. Emily, pictures of earrings that look just like yours. Lipstick on Jake's shirt. She described the time you spent together in the UK. Dinners, nights out, and I just couldn't get it out of my head. Emily's expression shifted from shock to anger. And she shook her head. Disbelief written across her face. I can't believe this. I don't know why she would do this. But I swear to you. None of it is true. Jake is an old friend. Nothing more. I took a shaky breath. Feeling the tightness in my chest loosen just a little. Then why didn't you tell me you were spending so much time with him? I trusted you. And finding this out through an email made me feel like, like I didn't know you. She looked at me. Her eyes filled with hurt. I didn't think it was a big deal. I went to catch up with old friends. And yes, I spent time with Jake. But it was always innocent. He picked me up from the airport because he offered. And we had dinner a few times. I would never cheat on you. I searched her face. 
looking for any hint of dishonesty. But all I saw was pain and frustration. Then why would she lie like this? Why go to such lengths? Emily sighed, her gaze distant. Jake's wife has never liked me. She's always been jealous, suspicious of his female friends. We've had issues in the past, and I've kept my distance from her because of it, but I never thought she'd go this far. We sat there in silence, the weight of her words settling over us. She seemed genuine, and as much as I wanted to cling to my suspicions, I couldn't ignore the sincerity in her voice. Still, the seed of doubt had been planted, and I wasn't sure if I could ever uproot it entirely. After a long pause, I spoke softly, my voice barely a whisper. I believe you, Emily, but this has shaken me, and I don't know how to move forward from here. I don't want this doubt between us, but it's going to take time to rebuild the trust this has broken. She nodded, her eyes brimming with unshed tears. I understand, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to prove to you that there's nothing to hide. I love you, and I would never do anything to hurt you. I took her hand, feeling the warmth of her skin beneath mine. And for the first time in days, I felt a glimmer of hope. We'd been through so much together, and I wasn't ready to let this tear us apart. It would be a long road to healing, but with her by my side, I knew we had a chance to rebuild what had been shaken. As I looked into her eyes, I realized that trust was a fragile thing, easily broken but not impossible to mend. The following days were tense, with a strange quietness settling between us. We were trying to move forward, but it was clear that the confrontation had left its mark. Emily was visibly shaken, though she did her best to reassure me, making a point to mention every call she took, every time she left the house, every minor detail she thought would ease my mind, but the openness somehow only intensified my doubt. It felt forced, like she was overcompensating, and the more she tried to reassure me, the more unsettled I became. I found myself observing her constantly, analyzing every interaction, every word, looking for any indication that the accusations might be true. The small gestures that had once brought me comfort now seemed suspicious. When she left her phone on the kitchen counter, I'd notice how quickly she picked it up when it buzzed. If she stepped outside to make a call, my thoughts would spiral, wondering if she was hiding something from me. I knew this mindset was unhealthy but it felt impossible to shake. One evening, as we were getting ready for bed, I saw her glance at her phone with a faint smile before setting it on her nightstand. It was the smallest thing, a private moment. Just a second, but it left me wondering who had texted her, what they'd said, and why she'd smiled at it. The image of that brief expression lingered with me long after the lights went out, feeding my mind with scenarios that only deepened my unease. In the weeks following our conversation, I found myself replaying the details of the email and the photos. Over and over, in my head, I became fixated on the earrings she'd lost in the UK. I could have sworn they were the same ones in the picture. And even though Emily had assured me they were missing, my mind kept circling back to them. I'd search through our bedroom drawers, her makeup bag, the bathroom cabinets, looking for any trace of them. Rationally, I knew this behavior bordered on obsessive, but I felt powerless to stop. Every time I came up empty-handed, the doubt gnawed at me, the unanswered questions multiplying. Emily must have noticed the strain I was under. She'd often ask if I was okay, if there was anything she could do to help. Each time, I'd brush her off, unwilling to admit that my suspicions were only growing. I wanted to trust her, to accept her reassurances at face value. But there was a darkness inside me that refused to let go. It was as though every time I tried to push the doubts aside, they resurfaced with twice the strength, and I was left even more confused and lost. One weekend, I finally took my son to a soccer game, something I'd been putting off for weeks because my focus was elsewhere. As we sat in the stands, I noticed a group of families around us, parents laughing and chatting easily with each other. For a brief moment, I envied them, their apparent certainty and peace. I wondered if they ever worried about trust or betrayal, or if they simply took their lives as they came. It felt like such a distant concept now, that sense of ease and comfort. I couldn't remember the last time I'd felt that way with Emily, and the realization stung. Later that night, Emily mentioned that she wanted to call Jake, to address the email directly and see if he knew anything about it. The suggestion blindsided me, I hadn't expected her to reach out to him after everything, and the idea made my stomach twist with a mixture of jealousy and dread. The thought of her talking to him, 
especially after everything I'd learned, was almost unbearable. Do you really think that's a good idea? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. She looked at me with a mixture of frustration and determination. I think it's the only way to put this to rest. She said, Jake knows his wife better than I do. And maybe he can shed some light on why she'd go to such lengths. I wanted to protest, to tell her not to reach out. But a part of me recognized that I had no logical reason to stop her. I was the one demanding answers. After all, and if talking to Jake could help, then maybe it was the right thing to do. Still, the thought of their conversation, their shared history, the connection they had in those years before I came along, left a bitter taste in my mouth. I knew I couldn't forbid her from calling him, but the idea still unsettled me. The next morning, I caught myself glancing over her shoulder as she typed a message on her phone. I couldn't see what she was saying, but my mind filled in the blanks, concocting scenarios where she was talking to him, reminiscing about their time together, maybe even keeping secrets I'd never be able to uncover. I could feel my sanity slipping, the doubt and jealousy coiling around my thoughts like a vice. A few nights later, Emily sat me down in the living room after the kids were asleep. Her face was tired, eyes rimmed with shadows, the weight of the past few weeks evident in her posture. I talked to Jake, she said, her voice quiet but firm. I asked him about the email, and he swore he knew nothing about it. He said he's never thought of me as anything more than a friend. I felt a surge of relief, but it was short-lived. Did you believe him? She looked at me, her expression resolute. Yes, I believe him and I wish you would believe me. Her words hung heavy in the room, and I looked away, unable to meet her gaze. I wanted to believe her, but I couldn't ignore the doubt still gnawing at me. She reached out, taking my hand in hers, and I felt the familiar warmth of her touch, but it didn't offer the comfort it once did. Please, she whispered, her voice cracking, I need you to trust me. I squeezed her hand, swallowing the bitterness in my throat. I'm trying, Emily, I really am. Over the following days, I did my best to move on, to take her word as the truth. She continued to be open, showing me her phone and trying to reassure me, but my mind refused to let go of the suspicion. The doubts had taken root, and no matter how hard I tried to shake them, they lingered, casting a shadow over everything. One night, unable to sleep, I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, the weight of the past weeks pressing down on me. Emily shifted beside me, murmuring in her sleep and I felt a pang of guilt and sadness. I'd never thought I'd be the type of person to let doubt consume me like this. To question the loyalty of someone I loved so deeply. But the email had left a scar. A wound that refused to heal. And I wasn't sure if I'd ever be able to fully trust her again. As the weeks turned into months, I began to accept that this might be our new reality. I still loved Emily, but the trust we'd once shared felt fragile. Like a delicate thread stretched too thin. I'd caught glimpses of the life we could have if I let go of the suspicion. But every time I reached for it, the doubt would rear its head, pulling me back into the darkness. One evening, as we sat across from each other at dinner, our daughter chattering happily beside us, I felt a strange sense of detachment, as if I were watching our family from a distance. I realized, with a sinking feeling, that the email had changed more than just my perception of Emily. It had altered my entire understanding of our relationship. And as much as I wanted to believe in the life we'd built together, I couldn't shake the feeling that something irreparable had been broken. Emily reached across the table, squeezing my hand, and I looked at her, seeing the sadness in her eyes. She knew, just as well as I did, that the doubt hadn't disappeared. And as much as we tried to ignore it, it lingered between us, a silent presence that neither of us could escape. As I lay awake that night, staring into the darkness, I knew that the path forward wouldn't be easy. I could feel the love I had for Emily, but I also felt the shadow of doubt, a weight that I wasn't sure would ever lift. The strain between us had become impossible to ignore. We both walked on eggshells around each other, trying to preserve some semblance of normalcy, but the air was thick with unspoken words and tension. Every time I looked at her, I saw a mixture of hurt and exhaustion, and I knew she felt it too. Our once easy companionship had eroded into something strained, almost unrecognizable, and neither of us seemed to know how to fix it. I spent days wrestling with the idea, pacing through my thoughts and battling my instincts. I knew what I had to do. If I was ever going to find peace, I needed to confront her again. I needed to see her phone, to look, once and for all, 
for any signs that could either confirm or dispel my suspicions. It was a move I'd avoided before, but the weight of uncertainty had become unbearable. One evening, as we sat across from each other in the living room, the words finally escaped my mouth before I had time to reconsider. Emily, I began, my voice steady but low. I need to see your phone. She looked up from her book, eyes widening slightly as she processed my request. For a moment, she didn't say anything, just stared at me as if she couldn't believe what she'd heard. Her face fell, a look of betrayal crossing her features that made my stomach twist with guilt. Again, she whispered, her voice barely audible. You really don't believe me, do you? Her reaction surprised me. I had expected resistance or defensiveness. But instead, I was met with a quiet resignation. A sadness that felt deeper than anger. I braced myself, trying to ignore the guilt gnawing at me. This wasn't about doubting her character. I told myself, it was about finding peace for both of us. It's not that I don't believe you. I replied, though I could hear the hollowness in my own words. I just, I need to put this to rest. I can't keep going on like this, wondering if there's something you're not telling me. She looked down, her hands tightening around her book, and I could see the hurt in her eyes. After everything I've done to reassure you, to show you there's nothing to hide, you still want to check my phone? Yes, I said, barely able to meet her gaze. I need to know. With a deep breath, she placed her phone on the coffee table, sliding it toward me. Her hands were trembling, and for a moment, I felt a pang of regret. A flash of shame at what I was about to do. But the need for answers pushed those feelings aside. And I picked up her phone. Unlocking it with a swipe. The silence in the room was suffocating as I began to scroll through her messages. My heart pounding with each swipe. I moved through the recent texts. Scanning names and conversations. Finding nothing unusual. She had been open with her friends. Our family. Even with co-workers. Discussing everyday things like the kids. Weekend plans and small talk that felt far removed from the suspicions consuming me. After checking her messages, I went through her call logs, looking for anything that might connect her to Jake in a way that might confirm the email's allegations. But there was nothing, just the routine calls she'd made and received over the past few weeks. Everything perfectly mundane. Finally, I scrolled through her photos, my hands beginning to tremble as I neared the end of my search. Each photo was familiar pictures of our kids, snapshots from family outings, candid shots of sunsets, and random moments she'd captured, but nothing suspicious, nothing to fuel my suspicions. As I stared down at her phone, I felt the weight of my actions settle over me, pressing down like a stone in my chest. I'd searched through her life, invaded her privacy, and for what? The sense of satisfaction I'd expected was nowhere to be found, instead. I felt hollow, the trust between us strained to its limit. I set the phone down, unable to meet her gaze. I'm sorry, I muttered, the words falling flat in the silence. There's nothing, I just, I thought. Emily sat quietly, her expression unreadable. She took a deep breath, and when she spoke, her voice was steady but filled with a sadness that cut deep. Do you understand now, what this has done to us? I nodded, guilt pooling in my chest. I'm sorry, Emily, I didn't want to hurt you, but I couldn't stop thinking. I needed to be sure. Her eyes met mine, and I saw the tears she was holding back. I've spent weeks trying to reassure you, to show you that I'd never betray you. But no matter what I do, it's never enough, is it? I opened my mouth to respond, but the words caught in my throat. She was right. I'd pushed her to her breaking point. Let the accusations of a stranger turn me against the person I'd trusted most in the world. I'd spent all this time looking for proof that she hadn't betrayed me only to find that I was the one who'd betrayed her. I don't know how to fix this. I admitted, my voice barely a whisper. I just, I thought that if I looked, I'd find peace. Emily closed her eyes, a single tear slipping down her cheek. And did you? Did you find what you were looking for? I shook my head, shame washing over me. No, all I found was, was proof that I let my doubt ruin everything. For a long moment, we sat in silence the weight of our shared pain filling the space between us. I wanted to reach out, to tell her that I still loved her, that I was sorry for letting my suspicions poison our marriage. But the words felt empty, inadequate. She finally looked at me, her gaze steady but filled with sadness. I don't know if I can keep living like this. She said quietly, I love you, but
But I can't keep proving myself over and over. Hoping that one day, you'll trust me again. Her words cut deep, and I felt a hollow ache spread through my chest. I'd pushed her away, driven a wedge between us that might never heal. And as much as I wanted to fix things, to go back to the way we'd been before, I knew that some things, once broken, could never be made whole again. Emily stood up, brushing away the tears from her face. I need some space, she said, her voice barely audible. I need time to figure out if I can keep doing this. I nodded, unable to find the words to make things right. She left the room, her footsteps soft against the carpet. And as I sat there in the empty living room, I felt the full weight of my choices press down on me. The silence was deafening, filled with the echoes of everything we'd lost. In the days that followed, I tried to give her the space she'd asked for. We continued our routines, taking care of the kids, sharing quiet meals, but the connection between us felt fragile, like it could shatter at any moment. I wanted to tell her that I was sorry, that I'd made a mistake, but the words felt hollow, and I knew that apologies could only go so far. I spent those days replaying everything that had happened, every choice I'd made that had led us to this point, the email, the doubts, the search through her phone, it all seemed so pointless now. A string of actions that had only served to push us further apart. And as much as I wanted to believe that we could repair the damage, I couldn't ignore the gnawing feeling that I'd crossed a line we could never uncross. Emily remained distant, her laughter and warmth muted, as if she were guarding herself from further hurt. She'd smile at the kids, joke with them, but whenever we were alone, the silence between us felt heavy, filled with words neither of us dared to speak. One evening, as we sat across from each other at dinner, she looked up, her eyes meeting mine with a quiet intensity. I don't know if I can do this anymore, she said softly, her voice steady but filled with sadness. My heart clenched, and I felt the full weight of her words settle over me. I'd known this moment was coming but hearing it aloud was like a blow to the chest. I wanted to reach across the table, to hold her hand and tell her that we could fix things. That I'd do anything to make things right, but I knew that trust, once broken, was not easily repaired. I'm so sorry, Emily, I whispered, my voice barely audible. I don't know how to make this right, but I want to try. I want us to be okay. She looked at me, a mixture of sadness and regret in her eyes. I want that too, she replied but I don't know if it's possible. Not after everything that's happened. And with those words, the last remnants of our once strong connection faded, leaving only the hollow ache of what might have been. After our conversation, things between Emily and me shifted into something resembling a fragile truce. She hadn't made any decisions about our future, and though I tried to take solace in that fact, the silence that settled between us was suffocating. Days turned into weeks, and though we continued living under the same roof, our lives felt like they were happening side by side, barely overlapping. The kids noticed the tension, asking questions about why we didn't laugh as much, and it broke my heart to realize that the rift between us was something they, too, could feel. As the initial shock wore off, I began to feel the full weight of my actions. I'd let doubt take root in my mind and turn my life upside down. The email, the accusations, all of it had pulled me so far from reality that I'd been willing to risk everything on a hunch. And now, as I sat in the echo of my decisions, I realized just how much I'd given up. Emily had withdrawn from me in a way I'd never seen before. She still took care of the kids, still did her job and fulfilled the commitments that kept our household running. But her spirit, the warmth and humor I'd loved, was noticeably absent. The love we'd shared had been replaced with a cautious distance as if she were waiting for me to cross yet another line. It hurt to see her that way, and it hurt even more to know that I was the reason behind it. One afternoon, I sat down with Chris, the friend who'd given me advice when this ordeal began. He listened as I told him everything, the confrontation, my request to see her phone, and Emily's reaction. I didn't leave anything out, hoping that his perspective might help me make sense of the mess I'd created. Sounds like you're dealing with a lot of guilt, he said his tone calm and steady, but you did what you thought was best at the time. I shook my head, feeling a lump rise in my throat. No, I didn't, I acted out of fear and jealousy. And now, I don't know if I'll ever be able to undo the damage I've done. Chris leaned back, crossing his arms, look, I get that this is complicated, you've been through a lot, and I don't think you're entirely to blame, but you're also right to feel guilty. 
Trust isn't something that you can just take back once it's been broken. I know, I replied, my voice barely a whisper. I just don't know how to fix it. Chris nodded thoughtfully. Maybe it's not about fixing it. Maybe it's about rebuilding. She's hurt. And you're hurt. And it's going to take a lot of time and patience to get back to where you were. His words stayed with me as I drove home that evening. I'd been so focused on finding proof or disproving the email that I hadn't considered the emotional toll it was taking on both of us. If I wanted any chance of healing our relationship, I needed to shift my focus from the past to the present. I couldn't change what I'd done, but maybe, with time, I could start to rebuild what had been broken. In the days that followed, I tried to be more present for Emily, to show her that I was committed to making things right. I took over some of her usual tasks like making dinner or putting the kids to bed, hoping that my actions would speak louder than words. I didn't press her for forgiveness, knowing that it wasn't something she could give right away. Instead, I focused on small gestures, quiet ways of showing her that I was willing to do the work. No matter how long it took, it was slow going. Emily still kept her distance, though she seemed to appreciate the effort I was putting in. She was polite, even kind at times but there was a guardedness to her that hadn't been there before. It was as if she'd built a wall between us, one that I wasn't sure I'd ever be able to break down. One evening, as we sat in the living room after the kids had gone to bed, I decided to speak up. I didn't expect anything from her, but I needed her to know where I stood. Emily, I began, my voice soft but steady. I know I can't undo what's happened. I can't take back the way I doubted you. And I know that I hurt you but I want you to know that I'm willing to do whatever it takes to rebuild our trust. I don't expect you to forgive me right away, and I don't expect things to go back to normal. I just want you to know that I'm here, and I'm not going anywhere. She looked at me, her eyes filled with a mixture of sadness and something else I couldn't quite place. Thank you, she said quietly, her tone guarded. I appreciate that you're trying, but I don't know if I'm ready to move forward yet. I need time to process everything, to figure out how I feel. I nodded, understanding that her need for space was part of the process. I understand. Take all the time you need. I'll be here when you're ready. Our conversation ended there, but I felt a sense of relief knowing that she hadn't closed the door entirely. It was a small step, but it was enough to give me hope. I knew that it would take more than words to prove myself. But I was prepared to do whatever it took. Over the next few weeks, I continued to show up for her, to support her in ways that I hadn't before. I made a point of being open about my own actions, letting her know where I was going and who I was with. Not because she demanded it, but because I wanted her to feel secure. I began to understand that rebuilding trust was less about grand gestures and more about consistency. About showing her, day by day, that I was committed to our relationship. It wasn't easy. There were moments when the doubt crept back in, whispering that I was only delaying the inevitable, that our marriage would never recover. But each time, I pushed those thoughts aside, focusing on the progress we were making. No matter how small, I knew that if I wanted any chance at a future with Emily, I had to be patient, to give her the time and space she needed. One evening, as we sat at the dinner table with the kids, I caught a glimpse of the woman I'd fallen in love with. She laughed at something our youngest said, her face lighting up in a way that I hadn't seen in weeks. It was a small moment, but it filled me with hope. A reminder of what we'd once shared. After the kids had gone to bed, I found her in the kitchen, cleaning up the dishes. I approached her, reaching out to take her hand. She looked at me, surprised, but didn't pull away. Thank you, I said softly, my voice filled with gratitude, for giving me a chance to make things right. She looked down, her fingers lacing with mine. I don't know if I'm ready to forgive you yet. She admitted, her voice barely a whisper, but I'm willing to try. It wasn't a full reconciliation, but it was a start, a small step toward healing the wounds we'd both suffered. I knew that the road ahead would be long and challenging, but in that moment, with her hand in mine, I felt a sense of hope that I hadn't felt in weeks. We were still fractured, still struggling to find our way back to each other, but for the first time, I believed that we might just make it. The days that followed were filled with quiet moments of rebuilding. Small gestures of kindness and understanding that gradually began to mend the fractures between us. We were both scarred, carrying the weight of our shared pain, but we were willing to carry it together. And though the road ahead was uncertain, I knew that as long as we continued to move forward, one step at a time, 
there was a chance that we could find our way back to each other. Rebuilding a life together wasn't something I'd ever imagined would feel so fragile. So dependent on each careful moment, Emily and I were moving forward in the smallest of ways, with me focusing on being present and consistent, doing what I could to show her that I was committed to rebuilding our relationship. But each day felt like I was balancing on a thin line, aware that one misstep could bring everything crashing down again. Our lives continued to intertwine, as they always had, through shared responsibilities with the kids, decisions about work and family, and all the day-to-day -day routines. But now, every interaction felt like it had layers beneath it. Moments that were once filled with easy familiarity now felt cautious, as if we were trying to navigate a path that we didn't entirely trust anymore. Even though she hadn't pulled away completely, I knew that part of her was still guarded, and I respected her need for time. We shared meals, laughter with the kids, and quiet evenings. But I could sense the difference, the careful distance that Emily kept, as if she were still evaluating whether she could truly trust me again. I made a conscious effort not to push her, to respect her space, and to prove myself in small ways. I'd offer to take the kids to school, make her favorite coffee in the morning, and listen without expecting anything in return. I wasn't sure if these gestures were enough to bridge the gap between us. But I hoped they'd help us find our way back to each other. One weekend, we took the kids to the park for a picnic. It was something we'd always done before everything had happened. But this time, it felt different. We laughed as we watched the kids play, and Emily's smile, for a moment, looked almost like it used to. There was a lightness in her eyes that I hadn't seen in months, and I felt a surge of hope, a glimpse of the life we used to share. As the kids ran off to play on the swings, I reached for her hand. And to my surprise, she didn't pull away. We sat there in comfortable silence, watching our children and soaking in the warmth of the sun. It was the first moment of peace we'd shared in a long time, and I felt a sense of gratitude that I hadn't known I'd lost. For a moment, everything felt right, as if the rift between us had faded away, and I dared to believe that we might actually find our way through this. But as much as I wanted to hold on to that hope, I knew that one moment didn't erase the damage we'd suffered. There were still days when I could sense the lingering doubt in her eyes, the flicker of distrust that reminded me of the hurt I'd caused, and even though I knew that she was trying to move forward, I couldn't escape the fear that my actions had left an irreparable mark on our relationship. One evening, as we sat together after putting the kids to bed, Emily turned to me, her expression thoughtful. "I want to believe we can move past this," she said, her voice soft but steady. But I need to know that you're willing to let go of the past too. I can't keep living with the shadow of that email hanging over us. Her words hit me hard, and I felt the weight of everything I'd put her through settle over me. I know, I replied, my voice filled with regret. I've spent so much time questioning things, but I realize now that I was holding onto a fear that wasn't real. I let that fear push you away, and I'm sorry. I'm ready to let it go for both of us. She nodded. Her gaze softening as she looked at me. It's not just about letting go; it's about rebuilding, step by step, and finding trust again. In that moment, I knew that she was right. Moving forward wasn't about pretending that nothing had happened or expecting her to forget the pain I'd caused. It was about proving, through each action and each word, that I was committed to our future together. And though I knew it would be a long journey, I was willing to walk it, no matter how difficult. The days that followed were filled with small steps toward healing. I'd catch her watching me with a mixture of curiosity and hesitation, as if she were still trying to understand the person I'd become. I made it a point to be transparent, to share my thoughts and feelings openly, even when it felt vulnerable. And slowly, I began to feel the walls between us start to weaken. One afternoon, while we were folding laundry together, she turned to me with a question that caught me off guard. Why did you believe the email? She asked, her voice calm but filled with a quiet intensity. What was it that made you doubt me? I hesitated, not because I didn't know the answer, but because I didn't want to relive the fear and insecurity that had driven me to doubt her. But I knew she deserved the truth, so I took a deep breath and tried to explain. It wasn't about you, I said slowly, choosing my words carefully. It was about my own fears and insecurities. I let them cloud my judgment. And I projected those fears onto you. The email it tapped into something I hadn't realized I was holding onto. It wasn't fair to you, and I'm sorry. She looked at me, 
Her expression thoughtful, and I could see that she was processing my words. I wish you had come to me with those fears instead of doubting me. She said quietly, I would have listened, and maybe we could have worked through it together. Her words were filled with a gentle wisdom, and I felt a pang of regret that I hadn't trusted her sooner. I know, I replied, my voice filled with remorse. If I could go back, I would have done things differently. But all I can do now is learn from it and make sure I never put us through something like that again. Emily nodded, a faint smile crossing her lips. I believe you, and I want to try to rebuild what we had, but it's going to take time. I reached for her hand, grateful for her honesty and her willingness to try. I'll give you all the time you need. I promised. I'm here, and I'm not going anywhere. In the weeks that followed, we continued to navigate our new normal. Building on the fragile trust that had begun to form between us. There were still moments of doubt, of hesitation, but they grew fewer with time. We'd find ourselves laughing together over a shared memory or sitting in comfortable silence. And each of those moments felt like a small victory, a step toward healing. One evening, as we sat on the porch watching the sunset, Emily leaned her head on my shoulder, a gesture that felt as familiar as it was precious. I felt a surge of gratitude. A quiet joy that I hadn't felt in months. We weren't the same people we'd been before. But maybe that was okay. Maybe this was a chance to build something stronger. Something deeper. Founded on a trust that had been tested and proven resilient. As the stars appeared in the sky, I felt a sense of peace settle over me. A peace I hadn't known since the email had turned our lives upside down. I knew there would still be challenges ahead. Moments of doubt and fear. But I also knew that we were committed to facing them together. And in that moment, I realized that, despite everything, we still had a chance to find happiness. To rebuild the life we'd once shared. As more weeks passed, the fragile truce between Emily and me began to solidify into something closer to real trust. The journey was slow, marked by hesitations and small moments of reassurance. Each day, I focused on the present. On being fully available for our family and for her. Letting go of the fears and doubts that had once consumed me. It was a daily choice to put the past behind us. One that required patience and a commitment that felt deeper than anything I'd experienced before. The kids were our constant. Their laughter, their endless questions, and their small triumphs reminded us of what truly mattered. Grounding us in the life we'd built together. They didn't know the struggles we'd been through. But they seemed to sense the changes. The renewed effort Emily and I were making to be there for each other. I'd catch her glancing at me when we'd sit down to help with homework or cook dinner together. And though her gaze was still guarded, there was a warmth that hadn't been there in months. One evening, as we were putting the kids to bed, Emily turned to me with a soft smile. Thank you for being here, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. For the kids, and for me, her words, so simple yet filled with meaning, hit me hard. I felt a surge of gratitude, a realization that, Despite everything we'd been through, we were both committed to finding our way back to each other. I'm grateful to be here. Emily, I replied, my voice filled with sincerity. I don't take it for granted anymore. She nodded, her eyes softening, and for the first time in a long time, I felt like we were on the same page. We weren't pretending that the past didn't exist, instead, we were choosing to move forward. Together, despite it, in the weeks that followed, we fell into a rhythm of small gestures that seemed to rebuild the bond between us. We'd linger over coffee in the mornings, sharing bits and pieces of our days, laughing over stories about the kids, or simply enjoying each other's company in comfortable silence. It wasn't the intense passion we'd shared early on, but something quieter, more resilient, a partnership that had been tested and was finding its way back to trust. One Saturday afternoon, while the kids were playing in the backyard, Emily suggested we take a walk. It was something we used to do often, but had fallen out of habit over the last year. We strolled through our neighborhood, talking about the little things, the changing seasons, a new family that had moved in down the street, the kids' recent fascination with superheroes. As we walked, I felt the tension that had been with us for so long start to melt away. Replaced by a quiet sense of peace, we stopped at a park bench, watching the trees sway in the breeze and she turned to me, her expression thoughtful, I've been thinking about us, about everything that's happened, she began, her voice steady but gentle, and I realized that maybe, in some strange way, all of this has shown us what we're really capable of as a couple, 
I listened, feeling a mix of relief and curiosity. What do you mean? She looked out at the trees, choosing her words carefully. It's easy to love someone when things are good, but when things get hard, when trust is broken and you're forced to face the worst parts of yourself and each other, that's when you really see what your relationship is made of. Her words resonated with me, and I felt a sense of humility, a reminder of the mistakes I'd made but also of the resilience we'd shown. I never wanted to put you through that, I replied, my voice filled with regret. But you're right, we've faced things I never thought we'd have to, and we're still here. She reached for my hand, a small but significant gesture, and I felt a warmth spread through me as I held it. I don't know what the future holds, but I want us to keep choosing each other. Every day, she said softly, to keep moving forward, even if it means rebuilding things one piece at a time. I nodded, feeling a surge of hope. I'm all in, Emily, I'll keep choosing you, every day, no matter what it takes. We sat there in silence, watching the world go by, and I felt a profound sense of peace, a quiet joy that was different from anything I'd experienced before. It wasn't the perfect ending I'd once envisioned for us, but it was real, honest, and filled with a depth that only comes from weathering life's storms together. As we made our way back home, I realized that, though the scars of the past would always be a part of us, they didn't have to define us. We'd chosen to face our struggles to be honest with each other, and to rebuild a love that had been tested and proven resilient. That night, as we tucked the kids into bed and settled in for a quiet evening, I felt a renewed sense of gratitude, for Emily, for our family, and for the journey that had brought us to this place. We'd faced our darkest moments, but in doing so, we'd found a strength that I hadn't known was possible, and though the road ahead would still have its challenges, I knew that as long as we continued to choose each other, there was nothing we couldn't face together. As the months passed, the once fragile trust between Emily and me grew more resilient. Our journey toward healing had taught me that rebuilding a relationship isn't about erasing the past but about choosing to move forward despite it. With each small moment of connection, every shared smile or quiet word, we wove together a new bond, a bond that wasn't as easily shaken as it had been before. I still carried the scars of the choices I'd made but they no longer defined me. Instead, they reminded me of the strength Emily and I had found in one another. We'd both been tested, pushed to confront parts of ourselves that we might have otherwise ignored. And through that process, we'd discovered a depth of resilience I hadn't known we possessed. I was humbled by the lessons the past year had taught me. And I felt grateful for every chance I had to show her that I was a better man because of them. Our family found its rhythm again, filled with laughter and small precious moments, the kids sensed the change, sensing the shift back to a home that felt whole. On some nights, Emily and I would stay up late, talking in whispers or sitting in silence, simply enjoying each other's company. Our conversations flowed more naturally, laced with a new understanding and respect for one another that had come from facing our worst fears and finding a way through. One evening, as we sat on the porch, watching the sun dip below the horizon, Emily reached for my hand. Her touch felt familiar yet profound, and I looked over at her, feeling a swell of gratitude. Do you think we'll ever completely get past it? She asked softly. Her eyes searching mine, I took a deep breath, considering her question, I don't think the past ever truly goes away. I replied, choosing my words carefully, but maybe that's okay, maybe it's a reminder of how far we've come. She smiled, nodding, I think you're right, the past might always be a part of us but it doesn't have to define us. We sat in silence, watching as the first stars began to emerge against the darkening sky. I realized that our journey had given us something we hadn't had before, a bond forged in resilience. Strengthened by the trust we'd chosen to rebuild, it wasn't perfect, but it was real, and that was enough. In the days that followed, I found myself reflecting on everything we'd been through, the fears, the doubts, the quiet moments of reconnection, our relationship was no longer a place of easy certainty, but rather a space of mutual respect, forgiveness, and commitment. We were no longer the people we'd been before, but perhaps that was a gift, a chance to build something more authentic. As time went on, I realized that trust, once broken, could indeed be restored, but it required patience and an unwavering dedication to honesty. I'd learned to communicate openly, to listen without judgment, and to love Emily for who she truly was not for who I thought she should be.
She, too, had found her own strength. A quiet resilience that made me admire her more deeply than ever before. One Saturday morning, as we prepared breakfast together, Emily turned to me with a soft smile, her eyes shining with warmth. I'm proud of us, she said, her voice filled with quiet conviction. We've come so far. I smiled, feeling a sense of pride and gratitude well up inside me. Me too, I replied, reaching over to take her hand. I wouldn't want to be here with anyone else. Our journey had been long. Marked by moments of darkness and doubt, but we'd chosen to face those challenges together. We'd come out on the other side stronger, more connected, and more committed to building a future filled with love and understanding. Our family was whole again, and as we stood there, sharing a quiet moment in our kitchen, I knew that whatever challenges lay ahead, we were ready to face them together. In that moment, I understood that our story wasn't one of perfection, but of perseverance. We'd been tested and had emerged stronger, bound by a love that had weathered the storms and continued to grow. And as I looked at Emily, I knew that we had built something truly remarkable, a relationship rooted in resilience, trust, and the unbreakable bond of choosing each other every single day.